Good afternoon, everyone. I am uh, Larry Scogan. It's my good fortune to be president of Bismarck State College, and I want to welcome all of you to our campus. Um, we're going to, we've got a lot of announcements to make here today, and so uh, my good friend Clay Jenkinson has says dispense with the introduction. So I'm not even going to introduce him, so we'll just get right into the program good. here. Um, delighted to see so many folks out today. Um, we were sort of figuring we'd have seven. We've passed that number by a long way today. Um, and, uh, but we're really looking forward to today, and I know a number of people were sort of inspired to show up today because they read Clay's column this morning about Charles Dickens, and so they said, hey, and there's a program today on it, so it worked out well. So, um, First, let me get rid of all of the announcements that we're going to make. Got, I'm full of them here. All right. So the conversations folder that you all have that shows you what the rest of the programs will be, will be. if you haven't picked that up, please pick that up on your way out. Um, of import as well is this nice white card. For those of you that have email addresses, if you will fill this card out and put your email address on it, Robin will ensure that she sends you about a week's notice before each presentation and lets you know a reminder of uh, the next presentation coming up. She assures me she does not sell those email addresses, that they are only good for BSC Talk, and so I certainly encourage you to do that to get some email notifications as these come up. The really big news for conversations is on this little yellow sheet that you got today. Uh, we are actually moving the conversations. They're still on campus, but right across th from the parking lot here on the so southernmost ledge of our campus, is the National Energy Center of Excellence. Uh, we have been working for a number of years, and thanks to the governor and the legislature, this last legislative session, we got to finish that space off. And we are gonna move the conversations over to that. It's gonna be a very different environment than what we do here at Sydney J. Lee. Um, and I think it's gonna be a lot more intimate, and if you've not been on the top floor of the National Energy Center, which overlooks the Missouri River. I think you're really gonna be impressed to come up there and see that beautiful view. As someone t uh, mentioned to me earlier that uh, if we bore you, you can just turn around and look at the river and, uh, and it's a beautiful view, so that's, that's marvelous. So at any rate, the, the conversations now for the rest of the time, uh, our conversations will be in uh, what we are calling the Bavendick State Room uh, and that'll be real obvious to you when you get up on the fourth floor, um, the Bavendick State Room, and that will be set up. And it'll be set up just like we are right now, except it'll be a lot more intimate and uh, a lot more airy and, and bright. So we're looking forward to that. So next, the next conversation, which is January 27th, will be held then in the Bavendick State Room in the National Energy Center of Excellence. Um, we also certainly encourage all of you to please, please fill out these evaluations. Uh, it's helpful to us to know what we're doing right, what, sh what suggestions you might have. We do read all of your comments, so please uh, keep those coming, uh, in, uh, and so you've got a little sheet of paper on that. Also, if you did not pick up on the way in, please pick up on the way out this card that says save the date, November 5th through 7th, 2013. Um, last time we had a conversation about John F. Kennedy and uh, November of 2013 is the 50th anniversary of his assassination and what we're going to do is we're not just focusing on the assassination but we're focusing on the fact that uh, of John F. Kennedy's 1,000 days in office and then we will end the symposium then talking about his assassination and some of the theories on that. The keynote speaker, and we're really excited about this, the very first evening uh, the keynote speaker is uh, the, the Secret Service agent uh, Clint Hill, who is originally from Washburn. And for those of you that remember the scene of the Secret Service agent climbing up on the back of the presidential limousine and pushing Jacqueline Kennedy back into the seat um, uh, where she'd cl climbed up onto the trunk, that's Clint Hill. That's North Dakota's own Clint Hill. He has written a couple of books on this topic. Um, he will be given the keynote that the first evening to kick off the symposium and then the next day he's going to be um, giving another presentation that shows pictures of Mrs. Kennedy uh, because he was actually Mrs. Kennedy's um, Secret Service agent and uh, he's going to be talking about her and, uh, and another book that he's publishing on the Kennedys. So 
please grab that and, and mark that on your calendar. We also, our library, if you have never been involved in our book talk at the library, it's a wonderful program. Uh, folks are encouraged to read books, don't have to, but you can read the selected books and come and there's a discussion leader and it's like being at a very, very nice book uh, club. And uh, so at any rate, that starts, we do that every spring, and that starts on Sunday, January 6th. So that's coming up very, very quickly. And the first book is called Mountains Beyond Mountains by Tracy Kidder. And um, I certainly encourage you to read it. It's a wonderful book about uh, building a clinic in Haiti. And the term Mountains Beyond Mountains is a local saying that any time, and I'm sure that Lewis and Clark thought this, that any time they, they crested over a mountain, there was another mountain they had to crest over. And so in, in Haiti, that's sort of a local saying, is that any time you get over the top, there's another one that you have to climb over. And so it's a wonderful book. And, uh, and then uh, Paul Recessa Bagina's book, An Ordinary Man, about the uh, genocide in Rwanda will be the second book. Uh, third book is Unbowed, a memoir. So anyway, I certainly encourage all of you to do that. Um, the other thing is you should have gotten some handouts from Clay when you came in, a Charles Dickens timeline and his recommendations for reading Charles Dickens. Now many folks um, either watch this on uh, live stream or they watch them on uh, Channel 12. Uh, they're showing Tuesday nights on Channel 12. And you, uh, for those of you that are home that are watching us or that will be watching us in the future, you can get these handouts if you go to bsctalk.com, it's one word, bsctalk.com, and that has all of the resources that Clay has put together for these various talks. So if you're watching them on Channel 12, and you can actually watch them on, we're on demand, Clay. You can watch on demand on uh, freetv.org is the Channel 12 uh, Dakota Media Access website so you can go to freetv.org and, uh, and watch any of these uh, previous conversations on you, demand. I mean, you're saying that theoretically. Theoretically. If you couldn't sleep, and it were the <laughs> middle of the night on Christmas Eve, and you thought, boy, it's been a long time since I saw Larry and Clay, yeah. you could go on demand. And right there, you could choose your two, talk. Two in the morning. And anytime you want, yep. anywhere in the world, yep. you could tune in. I'd like to see the numbers on that. <laughs> you know, how many people have chosen that path? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, so that's my announcement. So, Mr. Jenkinson, over to you. Well, first of all, um, I'm just really thrilled to see so many people here today. Uh, and I really appreciate your coming. I ask you a question, but what I want you to do is to take the handout, and it's the one that's on the front recommendations for reading Charles Dickens. And then if you just turn to the back, there are two passages on it, one from A Tale of Two Cities and one from David Copperfield. I just want to start, maybe with, during this period of almost two hours we'll have time to go through a few passages because, of course, the whole purpose of having a session on Dickens is to remind ourselves of what an extraordinary literary artist he was. You know, the, if you think of the world's greatest artists, um, it's a very small number, really. Cervantes, uh, almost universally regarded as one of the top five novels that Don Quixote ever written. Shakespeare, Chaucer, uh, Leo Tolstoy, whose film adaptation of Anna Karenina is now playing in Bismarck, Dostoevsky, I mean, Flaubert, Victor Hugo. They're, there's a pantheon of the, of the greatest literary artists in prose and in poetry um, that sort of rattles around everyone's mind. In, an, in an almost any list of the greatest imaginative writers in the history of the West, at least, of Western civilization, Dickens is right up there. And there was a time, Larry, when everybody knew their Dickens. I've been, you know, I'm going through the, the correspondence of Theodore Roosevelt. And he'll say that somebody is a pumblechook, and somebody is a, is a pip, and, and somebody uh, is a Miss Havisham. And, he, and, and so he's sort of seeing the world with his reading of Dickens in mind. And this was almost universally true. 
Now, there was a time when characters out of Dickens, like Jaggers from Great Expectations or um, a Smike from uh, Nicholas Nickleby or uh, Miss Havisham from Great Expectations. Characters like that were as well known to the whole reading world as Tiger Woods and uh, Lindsay Lohan and Lady Gaga and Sha Shaquille O'Neal are in our time. I mean, literally, that the the, the the world conversations about where you, where you find common ground to talk about something revolved around characters out of Dickens in the late 19th century as much as those pop culture figures like Paris Hilton and Britney Spears occupy our popular consciousness in our time. And, you know, so the Dickens, in our time, Dickens is often seen as difficult to read or dense or long, but Dickens in his own time was the most popular writer on earth. And when he came to the United States in 1842 for the first of two visits that he would make, he was one of the world's first true international celebrities. And he was overwhelmed when he got here by the response. So for us, Dickens is a character out of English literature, and he's not that much read anymore. But until very recently, Dickens was almost the novelist of novelists in the English language. And the only other literary figure in the English language that he could really justly be compared with was Shakespeare. So think of that reputation that he established. He only lived for 58 years. He was born in Portsmouth on the south coast of England in February of 1812, and he died of a stroke um, in, at Gads Hill at his home in Kent um, in June of, of, of 1870. So he had a pretty short life. And in the course of that life, he wrote innumerable newspaper pieces, his famous Christmas stories, the most famous of which is The Christmas Carol in 1843, but he also wrote 15 novels, and half of them at least are amongst the great novels in the English language. So if you just look for a moment at The, the Tale of Two Cities, most people have at some point in their lives read A Tale of Two Cities that used to be taught in middle school or in the freshman or sophomore year, but this is, this is arguably the most famous passage in Dickens because it's so often quoted, which is to give you a flavor of his um, capacity as a pro stylist. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven. We were all going direct the other way. In short, the period was so far like the present period that some of its noisiest authorities insisted on its being received for good or for evil in the superlative degree of comparison only. There were a king with a large jaw and a queen with a plain face on the throne of England. There were a king with a large jaw and a queen with a fair face on the throne of France. In both countries, it was clearer than crystal to the lords of the state preserves of loaves and fishes that things in general were settled forever. It's hard to think of anything that could be better than that, although wait till you hear the opening passage from Bleak House a little later in our program. So let me ask a quiz, and this is not meant to shame anyone or anything else, but how many of you have read a Dickens novel in the last 10 years? Look at that, Larry. It's a lot. How many of you have never read a Dickens novel? Here's your <laughs> chance. Uh, and how many of you read most of what you've read in Dickens in school? <laughs> See, that's what happened, Larry. <laughs> Dickens has, has kind of begun to, I doubt that he's much taught in school now. Um, so then anyway, that's pretty interesting. Almost everybody in the room has a, has, uh, how many of you are mostly Dickens of A Christmas Carol? That's not very many. 
That's great. It's probably his most famous work. It is. Yeah. Uh, it's not, I'm not very fond of A Christmas Carol, but it is one of those works that is bigger than literature. It's, it's one of the world's fables that yeah. if you go on to, I was, my daughter was home for Thanksgiving and we were, she loves to sort of surf around on cable television. And the, you could find 50 knockoff versions of A Christmas Carol at any given time. Mm -hmm. You know, it's always the same on Lifetime, an overworked executive woman who doesn't have time to play. You know, it's the same thing over and over again. It's an amazingly um, flexible piece of great literature that is overused, I think, but it's amazing how many knockoffs there are on A&E. Yeah, yeah. So, let's, let's start. Ostensibly, we're talking about this book, um, American Notes for General Circulation, that was written in October, published in October of 1842 after his five-month visit to the United States. But when I was doing this, I reduced that because I think what we both found, I, re I read this for the first time for this program, and I'm guessing you did too, it's not a great book. <laughs> it, you know, here's this guy who wrote nothing but great books, and we happen to pick one that is not. And he was panned for it back home. It's an interesting book. Well. So yeah. let's start this way, Larry. He came here in 1842. I'll give you just a few little factoids from 1842, and then you provide okay. a, a deeper historical milieu. Okay. 1842, first adhesive postage stamps were issued in the United States. 1842. I didn't know that. You want to say that every time here? <laughs> <laughs> no, we're okay. Okay, great. Uh, first known sewing machine patented in the United States. Massachusetts, this would be of interest to Dickens, passed the first American child labor law. 500 Mexican troops briefly occupied San Antonio and then retreated. Ether was first introduced as an anesthetic in Georgia. Uh, the Seminole War, Seminole Indian War, ended in Florida, and the Seminole were removed from Florida to Indian Territory in Oklahoma. The U.S. Naval Observatory was authorized by the Congress. Mount St. Helens erupted. Um, the New York Philharmonic's first ever concert was performed in December of 1842. US, the United States recognized the independence of the uh, islands of Hawaii. Um, on May 16, 1842, the first organized train with 100 persons on it went along the Oregon Trail. The Oregon Trail opened in 1842. On August 9th, this, this will come to what you're going to say in a minute, the border between the United States and Canada, between the Rocky Mountains and the East Coast, was settled by treaty, the, the Webster um, uh, as Burton yeah. Treaty. Yeah. Um, the University of Notre Dame was founded in 1842, and the president of the United States was John Tyler. So now give us a more serious historical background. Well, what we were talking about, and this is actually going to play out, I think, as we're talking about Charles Dickens in the United States, and, and, um, and I'll just give you a, a real quick rundown of about 1836 to 1844, I think, and it's really important because what, what you're going to find out is Clay's talking about uh, Dickens in America and about that Notes on America, that book that we both read getting ready for this, is that uh, the United States really reacted negatively, is the easy way to say that, to Charles Dickens' visit and particularly to his book and to what happened during his visit and all this sort of stuff. But to put it in proper context, Clay and I were talking last night that maybe what we really need to talk about is the tensions between Great Britain and the United States at that time. There was rumors and rumors of, there were wars and rumors of wars. And in fact, Charles Dickens, before he even came to the United States, said that if the rumors of war and war continue, I will not go. And, that, and so the tensions were very, very high between the United States and Great Britain during this time. And there's two reasons for that, I would propose. One of them is the issue of slavery, and the other one is border disputes. Um, so the boundary, you know, we think in our northern border in North Dakota, here's the 49th parallel. And that's what Clay just said, that was finally solved in 1842. But it wasn't solved over in Maine, and it wasn't solved over in Oregon. 
And uh, in fact, the United States and Great Britain both claimed Oregon Territory, which ran from the northern border of today California all the way up to Alaska. Okay? And in 1844, James K. Polk will run as president on, on the campaign slogan 5440 or fight. 5440 is all the way to Alaska. And so James K. Polk is saying, we will fight the British over Oregon Territory. We're going to take all of it. Because they had, they had settled into both a sort of a joint administration of the Oregon Territory. So it's going all the way, again, to the northern border of California, all the way up to Alaska is Oregon Territory along the west coast. And jointly, the United States and Great Britain are trying to manage it. It's not working out. So in 1844, we've got a president of the United States saying that we're going to go all the way to Alaska or we're going to fight the British again. And of course, Charles Dickens here in 1842, so his timing was terrible. So, so that's the, one of the border issues. The other issue is the issue of slavery. Uh, Great Britain is an anti-slavery country. Uh, Britain is, is, in fact, very involved in maritime law about slavery, and they're trying to stop the slave traffic. And of course, the United States is very much into slavery. And in about 1838, uh, there's a slave ship called the Creole, and the slaves actually mutiny on this ship, and they take the ship to a British port, and in, that in the creates, Caribbean. pardon, in, in, the Caribbean. in the Caribbean, uh, to a British port down in the Caribbean, and then all the slaves are released. So the United States now is wanting uh, uh, compensation for the folks that lost money because the slaves were freed when they got into British territory because by British law, any slave that set foot in British territory was immediately emancipated, according to British law. So you've got, and in the United States, this tension between free and slave is really ratcheting up. In 1836, the United States Congress passed what was called the gag rule. And th there were petitions, hundreds of, tens of thousands of petitions were hitting Congress relative to the issue of slavery. And these petitions were all coming from the northern states, abolitionist groups. And when they were hitting Congress, it was really taking up so much time in Congress that finally, and, and plus it was uh, annoying the slaveholding states, and so they passed what was called the gag rule in 1836. Any petition that had to do with slavery, when it hit the House, was immediately tabled. No discussion on it. And John Quincy Adams, who after being president was elected into the House of Representatives, is trying to stand up and read these petitions because he's an abolitionist and he's trying to read these petitions and he's shot down constantly because the gag rule was enforced. So from about 36 to 43, the gag rule is enforced. So Charles Dickens shows up, and one of the things we'll talk about is he has an entire chapter, and if you're not interested in reading his book, Notes on America, but you're interested at all in an outsider's view of slavery in the United States, I highly recommend this one chapter, which I just read for the first time, uh, just getting ready for this talk. Um, it is an amazing chapter which Charles Dickens identifies how slavery has permeated into American culture, and we'll talk a little bit about that, I think, a little bit later. So at any rate, the point is that he shows up in 1842, he writes a book that's very critical of the United States, and there's this real negative reaction to him, but the reality is that the tensions are already there. So he's really walked into an environment that was all set up ultimately to, to react negatively to him and to increase the tensions between the United States and Great Britain. How's that? That's great. Okay. So, I mean, two things about that. One is that we, when we think about the United States and Britain, we think of the special relationship, of the, the, you know, the, the sort of deep affection, sharing a language and a constitutional tradition and so on, and that we're amongst the best friends that countries can be in the world. That's a, a recent phenomenon. And it really goes back to about the age of Theodore Roosevelt, and, and it was consolidated once and for all, really, during World War II. But it wasn't the case in 1842 when Dickens came here. The countries, for reasons you've said and others, were at each other's throats, 
and there were real possibilities of war during that period. So he came here at a time when you know, it would be like his coming here from, say, Iraq or Iran today, and then writing a book critical of the United States to boot. So there's that that we have to, that we have to remember, and, and, that, and that the issues were very serious ones that, that, that God worked out with painstaking um, negotiations. And that the, the, the border, you know, 54-40 or fight is Alaska, the border was eventually settled at the 49th parallel. So we didn't get nearly as much, the United States didn't get nearly as much of the Oregon country as it had wanted to, but it, it evened out the northern boundary of the United States when that was finally, was finally settled. The other thing, as you said, is that at, when Dickens came here, the country is in a period of unbelievable tension about slavery. And we're moving inev inevitably towards the Civil War. And he walks into it and, as an outsider, immediately finds the, the fact that there is still slavery in the United States to be appalling and doesn't mind lecturing about it and writing about it either. So it's an interesting time for him to have come. This is the great caricature of Dickens, you know, the carrying his books, burdened by his genius. This is the young Dickens. I love that portrait of him. The other thing to remember is when he came here in 1842, he was really just a very young man. He was 30 years old. He's not, you know, you sort of think that he's Dickens already having written the great works, but he hasn't. I'll come in a minute to the works that he had written at the time that he came here, but it's very important for us not to look at it from our lens, but to try to get into the lens of 1842. Just a couple of biographical details about Dickens. Born in 1812 on February 7th, when he had kind of an idyllic childhood until he was 12, his father, John Dickens, was a, a feckless, impecunious, sort of bankrupt person who always lived beyond his means. And so you see him, for example, in the character of Mr. Micawber in uh, David Copperfield. But his father wound up in debtor's prison in uh, when, in 1824 when Dickens was just 12. And today, you know, if you, if you can't pay your bills, you eventually file for bankruptcy. That's not how, how it worked then. It was the most paradoxical and ridiculous system possible. If you couldn't pay your bills, you wound up in debtor's prison. This is Marshall C. Debtor's prison in Southwark, which, which is where the Dickens, the whole family moved. Not just the debtor, the family <laughs> moved into this prison. And here's the, here's the craziness of debtor's prison. You go to debtor's prison, and then you have to pay your room and board. <laughs> and so, you know, there's sort of a paradox here, Larry. You, you're only there because you can't pay your bills, and now you have to pay your room and board. And so it's an, a, an insane system. Finally, the United States became the pioneer of modern bankruptcy law. So, and, and there are debtor's prisons all over Dickens' work, David Copperfield, but particularly at the end of the Pickwick Papers. The Pickwick Papers is his first great piece of literature. It's the one that made him an international celebrity and a household name. It's a very fun and funny, picaresque book about the wanderings of a small group of men around old England. But at the end, um, Mr. Pick Samuel Pickwick goes to prison, and the scenes of Pickwick in prison at the end of this novel darken the novel greatly and they remind us that Dickens could never get over this. He could never get over the collapse of the, of, of the sort of idyllic childhood that he had, had when, when he was 12 and the fact that they went to debtor's prison. And during this period, Dickens, who was just a kid, had to go to work in a factory. It's called a blacking factory. So he was bottling shoe polish and, and, a, and a material that was put on fireplaces. And he never got over this. He regarded this as, as a deep, deep degradation. These factories were squalid. There were rats. There were workers who were felons. And the conditions were just absolutely appalling. And you see this again and again. So that's one of the biographical details that he can't get over. The second is that he married a woman named Catherine Hogarth, 1836, so just not so long before he came to America. She had two sisters, Georgina and Mary. And if you read biographies of Dickens, it seems like he really should have married Mary. 
because he loved her more completely than he loved his wife, Catherine, and Mary lived with them for a time. I'm not, I'm not suggesting any significant impropriety, but his real soul mating was with the younger sister, Mary, and he never really had much in common with his wife, Catherine, and Mary dies as a very young woman, and Dickens never got over that either, and you can see echoes of this loss over and over and over again in his novels. And then later in life, he eventually left his wife, Catherine, in 1858. He fell in love with a young actress. And then Georgina, her even younger sister, became sort of his best friend in the last years of his life. And so his, his romantic life was troubled. You know, novelists are not fun to be with anyway because they're in a room writing novels, but he never got over this sort of confused, romantic focus and his deeper love of Mary than the love of his wife, Catherine. So that's the second thing. Um, then there is the, the issue of serialization. You know, today a novelist sits in a room for two or three years and writes a novel, and then at that moment, and only at that moment, it's issued into the world. The world sees it as a complete thing. That's not how Dickens worked. Dickens was one of the pioneers of the serialization of fiction, and so his novels appeared either in monthly installments of between six and 10,000 words, or in sometimes weekly installments. And so if you take a, a book like Oliver Twist, one of his first novels, it didn't appear as a finished product until long after it had already been known to the British reading public. So week one you read, or let's say month one, you read a 7,000 word introductory set of chapters. A month later he's gonna write the second one. He's not quite certain where this is heading. In other words, it's not a finished product in his mind, and he let the public help to shape by their responses, how the novel developed. And so it's, it's sort of interactive in a very low-tech way. And because of that, I mean, the, some people complain about that aspect of Dickens, but, but I don't. I think it's an extraordinary one because he's listening. He's listening to the public. He's, he's not writing the way a novelist does today as sort of a complete narcissist just following his or her genius. He's writing with a public in mind and he's, he's listening to their responses and he's gauging what works and what doesn't work. And you can see it in the Pickwick Papers. The first few numbers of the Pickwick Papers are sort of not quite there. And then suddenly, wham, he gets it and he starts to listen. And, this, and the, the feedback mechanism builds his confidence and builds his sense that the, the public is responding to these parts of my imagination and not those parts. And that really gave him this, um, this enormous popularity. And he actually got, he actually wrote alternative endings for several of his novels based upon the kind of feedback mechanisms that he was getting from his audience. I, I don't want to get off no, Dickens for too long, but didn't Stephen King just try this online? Did, it, was, did, did anybody follow that? Is, yes. Is, is that a yes? Yeah, Stephen King did this, right? Serialized the uh, horror novel and it was released in segments and it was done completely online. I don't know, that, Peter, do you know, was it a successful or? No, uh, I don't know, anyway. Uh, so I guess I'm saying that it can still be done today. Not everybody's shut up in a room writing a book. Yeah, mostly they are though. Okay. Um, <laughs> And, you know, I, I have this in my own teeny tiny little way. I, as a newspaper columnist, it would be one thing if I were writing in, a, in Alaska and just sent stuff in, whatever happened to come to my mind, that would be a really dangerous thing to do. Because what's so important for me, and I think for anyone who's writing for a, a popular print audience, is that you have to write knowing your readers. You have to write, write knowing your public. And so you're not just writing, oh, this is what this should be, and this is what that should be. You're writing knowing that you're, you're writing within a, a milieu. You're writing within a community. And so that's what Dickens is doing on a much, 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 much greater scale, is, is writing 
with a feedback mechanism that's constantly tweaking his genius. And so if you don't understand that about his novels, a lot of things don't make any sense. Um, so there's that. And then finally, his theatricality. He had always been interested in Victorian theater and, and, and music and so on. And he became increasingly theat theatrical in his outlook. And around 1858, so pretty late and long after the trip to the United States, he began doing public presentations of his novels. Not all of them. You know, he would choose a scene here and a characterization there. But he would actually go on the lecture circuit, which he did in the United States in 1867 and 1868, but all over England and all over the world, to, to present, lecture from, and read from his novels. And he was so theatrical about it that it became a second source of greatness for him and a, and a second source of income. And many biographers believe it actually shortened his life because he would be, came to the United States in 1867 and 8 and he gave 76 readings around the country. And they would last two and a half hours. And then he, and he earned, I think, $96,000 from that, which would be like a $2 million. Oh. It's like a rock star. Right. Be like the Grateful Dead or Paul McCartney. Go on, they'd fill these giant auditoriums and people would pay a fortune. There were scalpers. But hearing Dickens perform was just as interesting to people as reading Dickens' novels, and in some ways more, because he, and I'll show you in a minute, he actually rehearsed to get facial features right, and he worked on different accents and different um, intonations for the different characters that he performed. So those are some biographical details that might be useful. Um, before you get off the prisons here, one of the things that struck me in this Notes on America was that every town he went to, he visited the prisons. And um, I know we had a little discussion, maybe you'd respond to this, and that's, you know, this is, uh, he's at the same, he's after Jeremy Bentham, who was a big prison reform in, uh, in what, the utilitarians. Mm -hmm. And John Stuart Mills would have been writing about prisons, and do you know what effect that had on him, or is, is this more biographical as opposed to utilitarianism? Well, he, first of all, he's fascinated by prisons for a number of reasons. They're so awful in England. But he also had that traumatic childhood experience, that adolescent experience of being in a debtor's prison and seeing his father destroyed and so on. And so he was fascinated by this, and he wrote about it almost with a fixation through the course of his work. But like many Europeans who came to see us when we were a new republic, you know, we're not a new republic any longer, but people like Mrs. Trollope and Tocqueville and Crevacour and others who came to visit America between 1787 and the Civil War, they came to see what this new republic really meant. They had heard all the Jeffersonian rhetoric about um, something new under the sun and you know, we have it in our power to begin the world over again and the United States was this uh, idealistic utopian new experiment in the Western Hemisphere. And they, people like Tocqueville, who wrote the greatest book ever written about America by an outsider, uh, came in 1832, so just a decade before um, Dickens, but they all come and they want to see our institutions. What are their schools like? What are their hospitals like? What are their prisons like? What are their um, asylums for the, for the deaf or for the insane? And so you can come to America and, and sort of do street observations in Boston and New York and Philadelphia, but all of these Europeans wanted to see the institutional application of American ideals. And so Dickens dutifully does that, and the first half of this book is almost exclusively trips to deaf academies and prisons and educational systems, and he likes them. He says, without question, they're all better than those of Europe and particularly of England. So I think that's what led him to do this. Here's what's left of it. If you've been to England, you can go to Southwark. This is what's left of the Marshalsea uh, debtor's prison. It was built in the 15th century and you know, not much improved since. This is an inn from Southwark. Southwark's the opposite side from the city of London on the Thames. This inn comes up. He writes about inns all of the time. Dickens. Um, was, was unhappy with the Industrial Revolution. And in fact, he came to the United States in 1842 on a steamship 
And he hated it and thought it would sink. And they had terrible storms. When he went back in June of 1842, he went back on a sailing vessel, and he loved it. And so we think just, the, you know, our, our mentality is just the opposite. Go with the high-tech industrial solution. He didn't like trains. He had a train accident, actually, uh, later in his life. And he didn't like steam or the industrial revolution at all. And so he deliberately sets his novels just before the great industrialization of Britain. And a lot of it is coaches and inns and the stage routes and so on. And this inn in Southwark comes up in a number of his novels. So trip one, January 22nd to June 2nd, 1842. Here's what the United States looked like then, Larry. And you notice North Dakota is so pathetic, it's not even organized. Yeah. We're, we're, you know, you've got, part of it is, the eastern half of North Dakota is part of Iowa territory. But I guess, so Bismarck would be part of Iowa territory, but Mandan would be part of unorganized territory in 1842. It's really off the conceptual map of the country. You have the existing states and some activity in the lower parts of, of these territories, and then it skips over into the Oregon country, which, as you said, was the point of greatest tension between the United States and Britain at the time. You see you have the Republic of Texas, but it's not all, all of what will become Texas. Um, so here's, here's what Dickens had done by the time he got here. He'd written sketches by Boz, we can come back to that. His first novel, The Pickwick Papers, serialized between 1836 and 1837. His first novel per se, a, 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 you know, Pickwick Papers is really a kind of a loose confederation of sketches. His first piece of organized fiction, Oliver Twist, 1837 to 39, Nicholas Nickleby, which I'm now reading for the first time. Uh, 1838 to 1839, The Old Curiosity Shop, 1840-41, and Barnaby Rudge, uh, which is seldom read now, 1841, um, February to, to November. So that's what he had written by the time he came to the United States. He had not yet written the great novels that we so completely identify with Dickens' genius, David Copperfield, which is a semi-autobiographical novel, Great Expectations, arguably his greatest piece of work. Bleak House, his second or first greatest piece of work. Hard Times, A Tale of Two Cities. He hadn't written a Christmas Carol. That came the year after he returned from the United States. And he wrote not only American Notes, which was his negative account of the United States in nonfiction, but he wrote a novel in the wake of his time here called Martin Chuzzlewit, which has about 12 anti-American chapters in it. And so he continued his assault on America in that book. So it's really important to remember that when he came here at the age of 30, he's just a kid, and he's not yet the Dickens that we associate with Charles Dickens. And he, at this time, he would have mostly been known as the author of the Pickwick Papers and the sketches uh, by Boz. So here's the route that he took. He, he only got as far west as St. Louis, which, of course, was pretty deep at that time. Um, he spent five months here, about one month of it in Canada. You were asking about Boz earlier. Mm -hmm. Dickens, at the age of 15, became a clerk in, the, um, in Gray's Inn, one of the inns, one of the legal um, colleges in London. And so a lot of his later fiction is set in, those, in the inns of court, the Gray's Inn, Lincoln's Inn, etc. And then he became a, a reporter, and he traveled all over England as a newspaper reporter, and he was a parliamentary reporter. And so he got a lot of journalism under his belt before he became a novelist. And he started writing these nonfiction sketches for London newspapers, and they would be a sketch of a tavern, you know, an evening at a tavern, or a sketch of a tenement house, or a sketch at a rag shop, you know, a curiosity shop where miscellaneous pawn-like items are sold, or a sketch of a, of a prostitute. But he, he, he began writing these sketches, and he decided he, they were being published anonymously, and then he created the pen name Boz. And so that became famous, and then eventually these were gathered together in 1834 into his first book, Sketches by Boz. 
And so that, that's really, most Americans would have known Boz more than they would have known anything else about him. Here's um, the cover of the edition of Boz from 1836. And then, but it wasn't for a while that they discovered who this was. Who the Dickens Boz could be puzzled many a learned elf till time unveiled the mystery and Boz appeared as Dickens' self. Uh, and these sketches were, when he started doing this, Larry, the prose was just sort of second fiddle to the, to the illustrations. Illustrators, and this one is uh, George Cruikshank, there were three or four associated with Dickens over the course of his career. They would produce the illustrations for these newspapers and they were very well done and very handsome. And the writer was just designed to kind of create ambiance around the primary thing that was being published, which were the sketches. Dickens was such a genius that that was soon reversed and the sketches became subordinate to the fiction. Yeah, Before you move on, a qu qu okay, so you were saying earlier at age 12 he is working in this bla blacking shop. Blacking shop. factory. And at 15 now he's, he's a law clerk. Okay. So where's his education? He's get, it's scattered. He never gets a full education. His father will start him off in a school, and then two months later they pull him out because they can't afford to pay for it. And so he never got a formal education. And probably, I don't want to sound, I don't want to be seen as suggesting that formal education is not a great thing. That's good. That's good. <laughs> but, but Dickens. Magnificent greatness probably comes because he did not get a formal education at Eton and Oxford or Cambridge or Edinburgh or someplace. Because that would have probably tamed out of him his anarchic, exuberant magnificence. You know, the, the greatness of Dickens is just the power of his imagination to overwhelm everything. And that probably would have been restrained in him by a serious formal education. So we're lucky. I mean, he clearly was literate because he, he wrote all that journalism, but he never got spoiled by an English major. Yeah. Well, what could be worse, really? Well, know? yeah. Well, when you look at, <clears throat> excuse me, when you read the, the opening paragraph of, of A Tale of Two Cities, there's not a sixth grade English teacher that would allow that to look like that. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, what would that sixth grade teacher do, Larry? Well, that would have to be broken up into oh, sentences. All right, that's enough. But that makes sense. It yeah. makes sense. So here's, here's one of those Boz scenes. This is called The Streets Morning, and this is a scene from London. And if you've read even Dickens for two hours, this sort of scene appears over and over and over again. So he was influenced by these, illustration, these illustrations by a range of, of artists, and he in turn then took them to, far, to deeper levels. Here's Oliver Twist, when it came out in book form, 1837-39. I'm just giving you a little sense of the Dickens before he got to America, the old Curiosity Shop, 1840-41. This is one of the most famous scenes in English literature, the death of Little Nell. And some modern critics say that in the, eight, in the 19th century, you couldn't read this without weeping uncontrollably. And in the 20th century, you can't read it without laughing hysterically. It's so sentimental and it's so over the top, but at the time, it was very, very serious. And, and England mourned for the death of a fictional character, Little Nell. This is Samuel Pickwick from the Pickwick Papers. Shyla Schaefer gave me this. This is a whisk broom or a clothes brush. When the Pickwick Papers were, were published, Dickens became the writer of the world and there were, there were, there was, there were paraphernalia. You could buy Pickwick anything, Pickwick spittoons, you know, Pickwick urinals, Pickwick book covers, Pickwick uh, dishes, Pickwick anything, and this is a, a Pickwick whisk broom, but this, there was merchandise the way you have it today in a Batman movie or a Spider-Man movie. Mm -hmm. There was Pickwick merchandise all over England. This is Nicholas Nickleby. This is, I find, I'm reading it now. I've never read it before. It's really a marvelous book. Dickens went to York um, on the east coast of England and went to some, some boys' schools, including this one. And he discovered that there were, these graves are from boys who would be sent by their parents to these boys' schools when they would never come home. 
was, there were, the, the conditions were just so deplorable. They were literally being starved to death, beaten to death, neglected, etc. And then, so he wrote Nicholas Nickleby after a field tour of some of the schools that were destroying young men. So this is when he gets to America. I can do nothing that I want to do, go nowhere I want to go, and see nothing that I want to see. If I turn into the street, I'm followed by a multitude. And he's a rock star. Here's what went wrong, as you know, Larry. The American people wanted the famous Charles Dickens to come here and be Boz. Funny, sentimentalist, literary. They wanted this celebrity, you know, the Paul McCartney of his time, to come here and do what Dickens does. He didn't do that. He did that on the second trip in 1867, 1868. On this trip, he's only 30, and he came here and he, 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 A, he criticized America for slavery and our habits, but B, he talked about international copyright. And what was happening is that there were no international copyright laws of the time, and so Dickens' novels would be published in England and he would make money on them, but they would be pirated by American printers, and he made no money on them. And so he's the best-selling author in the United States, and he gets no return for that work. And so he had reason to be upset by that, as anybody would be. We now are in protracted negotiations with China about the same sort of piracy in our own time for CDs and so on. So he then lectured across the United States about how unfair this was and how he felt as he says, that he was the greatest loser alive for writing these books that were universally read but not paid for. And that did not sit well with the American people, even though all the rightness was on his side. And they thought, we, hey, we want Boz. We don't want you coming here and criticizing us about our publishing law. And so this is um, what Sidney Moss said, and there are several books on, on this trip. The famous visitors seem to assume a double role here. The one of Boz, revered author and goodwill ambassador, the other of Dickens, who with his talk of copyright seemed to have come merely as a commercial traveler or as an unofficial agent representing one more British interest and in making one more exorbitant demand, and as you say, at that time of great tension. So he comes and, and seems like another unhappy Brit lecturing the United States. The Hartford Daily Times in Connecticut wrote this. At one of these dinners, they had these Boz dinners all over America where they would create scenery from the, the sketches by Boz, and people would dress up like characters out of Victorian England. And then there would be these tableaus where five people would just stand you know, in scenes, in poses out of Dickens for an hour. The tableau was a very big cultural form from the age of Jefferson until almost the Civil War. And these Boz banquets were lavish, and extraordinary sums were spent on them, and Dickens would be the guest of honor. And so the Hartford Daily Times in Connecticut says early in the trip that the Boz dinner passed off with the happiest of feelings on the part of all concerned and will be long cherished and will long be cherished by the company of a highly agreeable incident in their lives. But it goes on to say, Mr. Dickens... I'm assuming this is 1842, by the way. Yes. Okay. And this too. Both of them. <laughs> okay. uh, Mr. Dickens alluded in his remarks to an international copyright law. It happens that we want no advice upon this subject. It will be better for Mr. Dickens if he refrains from introducing this matter hereafter. By the time he left the country, he was persona non grata. He just offended us. Mm -hmm. And then he said this about um, tobacco culture. He went to Washington, D.C. As Washington may be called the headquarters of tobacco tinctured saliva, the time has come when I must confess without any disguise that the prevalence of those two odious practices of chewing and expectorating <laughs> began about this time to be anything but agreeable and soon became most offensive and sickening. Yeah. Way to make friends, huh? He spends a lot of time on this in his book, by the way. <laughs> on spitting? On the spitting piece of tobacco, too. And, yeah. Uh, has to wash his coat because uh, all the... People are, are, are... People are just spitting and he... They're projectile spitting. I, I, I'm sure he has overstated the situation. I mean, I don't you, know. I wasn't around in Yeah, if you, you would have overstated it if you'd been there. <laughs> I can imagine Larry in so, a spitting culture. Yeah. <laughs> so, 
But, but he spends a lot of time on this. He talks about the tobacco juice running down people's so faces. So we'll get to slavery and, in a minute, but this is his uh, conclusion about America. Uh, Remember, as I said earlier, these people are coming here because they have heard about this secular utopian miracle republic that's being created here. And then they get here and they find out that we're not quite <laughs> what we want the world to think we are. Yeah. A common theme in American history. He says, this is not the republic I came to see. This is not the republic of my imagination. I infinitely prefer a liberal monarchy to such a government as this. In every respect but that of national education, the country disappoints me. Well, if you publish that book, you're probably going <laughs> to have some enemies, right? Yeah. Now let's look at slavery. You read this and you were so impressed by this. Why? Yeah. Well, I, it, it's really interesting because um, the abolitionists would have said the same thing. The abolitionists in Massachusetts and up in the New England states would have said the same thing that Dickens concludes, and that is how can you treat humans so inhumanely and not expect to be an inhumane person? And so he really divides the southern folks into three parts, and I think we're going to talk He says there are three that, types of three slaveholders. Three types of slaveholders. And, and so we'll look at those more carefully, but it, he is spot on in exactly what the abolitionists were saying, that you can't have this kind of cancer within your society, the cancer of slavery, and expect to have a high, mor high morals in the rest of your country. That slavery, in effect, was dragging the country down to the gutter. That's what the abolitionists would have said. And Dickens was agreeing with them that there is no way you can be a high cultured, civilized society and treat people so inhumanely. And he goes at quite lengths of actually quoting what, yeah. what in effect were classified ads. Can you find that part? Classified ads for people looking for their runaway slaves. And about, you know. What, they, well, they're read some of those. There are four or five pages of them that he quotes verbatim from American newspapers from the, just the five months that he was here. This was as late as 1842. And what you see is that the slaves have been branded, I mean, literally branded like cattle on their cheeks, on their facial cheeks, that they have had their ears notched like cattle or sheep, that Many of the escaped slaves have broken bones or their teeth are all gone or they're, they're maimed in other ways from beatings that probably led them to escape and so on. So let me just give you a couple. They're just horrific. Ran away, this is a, a, a verbatim ad from a newspaper. Ran away a Negro woman and two children. A few days before she went off, I burnt her with a hot iron on the left side of her face. I tried to make the letter M. That's someone who's wanting this woman returned was committed to jail. A Negro man says his name is Josiah, his back very much scarred by the whip and branded on the thigh and hips in three or four places thus with a J-M. The rim of his right ear has been bit or cut off. And he just quotes hundreds of these. And you read them and it just absolutely sickens you to think that there were human beings that were treated this way in 1842. And his view is a country that can do this is going to have its general moral <clears throat> center degraded by it, right? And another one, uh, and I'll just quote this one quickly. It, 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 amazing story that he is quoting in the newspaper. We have just heard the particulars of a meeting which took place on Six Mile Island on Tuesday, and Six Mile Island is a place where they go to have duels. So took place on Six Mile Island on Tuesday between two young bloods of our city, Samuel Thurston, age 15, and William Hine, age 13. They were attended by young gentlemen of the same age. The weapons used on the occasion were a couple of Dixon best rifles, the distance 30 yards. They took one fire without any damage being sustained by either party except the ball of Thorsten's gun passing through the crown of Hine's hat. Through the intercession of the Board of Honor, the challenge was withdrawn and the differences amicably adjusted. That's the quotation from the Thir newspaper. 13 and 15. 13 and 15. So now Dickens goes on saying, if the reader will picture to himself the kind of Board of Honor which amicably adjusted the differences between these two little boys 
who in any other part of the world would have been amicably adjusted on two porters' backs and soundly flogged with birchen rods, he will be possessed, no doubt, with as strong a sense of this ludicrous character as that which sets me laughing whenever its image rises up before me. He is just appalled that two young boys can go out to this island to have a duel and shoot at each other. And then he goes on, and I won't read the rest of it, but then he goes on and says, thus is the character of a society that will allow slavery. If you allow slavery, you will allow two young men to go out and shoot rifles at each other. So it's hard then, then he said what they really needed was a spanking. Yes. Kind of takes a little of the edge off his moral righteousness, in my opinion. But, <laughs> yeah. you know. Okay, but then okay. he says there are three types of slaveholder. Now listen carefully to this. This is really fascinating. The first type are those moderate and rational owners of human cattle who have come into the possession of them as so many coins in their trading capital, but who admit the frightful nature of the institution in the abstract and perceive the dangers to society with which it is fraught, dangers which, however distant they may be, or howsoever tardy in their coming on, are as certain to fall upon its guilty head as is the day of judgment. So basically predicting what will happen in the Civil War. But he says that's the first type, the kind of reluctant slaveholder who sort of knows it's wrong, admits that it's wrong, can't quite extricate himself. This is a portrait of Thomas Jefferson. Second type. The second consists of all those owners, breeders, users, buyers, and sellers of slaves who will, until the bloody chapter has a bloody end, own, breed, use, buy, and sell them at all hazards, who doggedly deny the horrors of the system in the teeth of such a mass of evidence as never was brought to bear on any other subject and to which the experience of every day contributes its immense amount, who would at this or any other moment gladly involve America in a war, civil or foreign, provided that it had for its sole end and object the assertion of their right to perpetuate slavery and to whip and work and torture slaves unquestioned by any human authority and unassailed by any human power. Which was the exact arguments that led to the Civil War. Think of this. He's saying mm -hmm. that the mass of slaveholders are this person who not only don't acknowledge that it's wrong, but positively argue that it is beneficial socially and would fight a civil war to uphold this practice which he says any rational being of any sort must admit is an appalling violation of human decency and human right. Mm -hmm. And then the third. The third and not the least numerous or influential is composed of all that delicate gentility which cannot bear a superior and cannot brook an equal of that class whose republicanism means I will not tolerate a man above me and of those below, none must approach too near, whose pride in a land where voluntary servitude is shunned as a disgrace must be ministered to by slaves and whose inalienable rights can only have their growth in Negro wrongs. And what he's saying here is something deeper about America, that our obsession with equality means that we can't stand to be subordinate to somebody else. And so there's labor in America that Americans won't do because they'd be regarded as beneath their dignity, and so they're perfectly happy to import human beings as slaves, or more recently, perhaps, as undocumented illegal aliens, to do the work that nobody in, the, in equal America wants to do, but work that nevertheless needs to be done. He's saying that slavery, is a, in a certain sense, is, a, is, is perpetuated by America's obsession with equality. And Tocqueville spends a lot of time on that theme, too. Okay, now, I just want to go back here for a moment, folks. I just want you to listen to this piece one more time, just a little of it. Oops, that's Jefferson, sorry. Where am I? I've lost it. The second consists of all those owners, breeders, users, buyers, and sellers of slaves who will until the bloody chapter has a bloody end own breed, use, buy, and sell them at all hazards, who doggedly deny the horrors of the system in the teeth of such a mass of evidence as never was brought to bear on any other subject. I want to be real careful about this, but the thing that happened in Connecticut, you know, 20 children killed, 20 children slaughtered, 
All you can say is, what would a, what would a European of Dickens' capacity for satire and condemnation say about a country where in the few months we've had Aurora, the football, the NFL football player. Oregon. Oregon. Now this, I mean, this is not a discussion of what happens with guns in this country, but think of what a European of Dickens' variety would say about a country where we can, where this is becoming a routine matter. And I'm, I'm guessing he would say that there are deep historical roots of Americans' um, obsession with gun violence. Anyway, I think we should just be silent for about 15 seconds here because when you read about what happened there, you know, unbelievable that, I mean, imagine that, that community and these families. So he didn't make any friends on this trip. He went back to England, he published the book. It not only wasn't popular here, it wasn't even popular in England. It was condemned there too. Then he wrote Martin Chuzzlewit, which is a major novel with 12 anti-American chapters in it. It was actually quite a good novel, but it didn't make him any more friends in the United States. Then about this time he starts doing these professional readings. And here he had this desk designed for himself for these readings. This is the manuscript of Bleak House. I just wanted to show you what a, how much um, correction he did on his manuscripts. Trip two was 1867 to 1868. He learned his lesson. When he came back the second time, he didn't say a word about America. <laughs> the war is over now. And so he congratulates the United States on the successful conclusion of the Civil War. But he basically just gave readings, just became Boz again, did the, became the Dickens that we wanted him to be. So here he is. This photograph was taken just before he came over in 1867. Not a young man anymore. You can see the burdens of his life. This is, I was just at this hotel. This is the, Park, the Omni Parker House Hotel in Boston. And he gave some of, he prepared for some of his readings there. And this mirror is still there. This is the actual mirror from his time. And here's what he did that's just so fascinating. He, would, he, he was very theatrical, as I said, and he wanted to be animated when he portrayed Samuel Weller or Fagin or um, Wilkins Micawber. And so he would study himself in the mirror. He would read and practice these characters in the mirror and create faces and intonation and different Cockney and other English um, diction styles to master this. And when he was training for this at the Omni Parker House Hotel in Boston, people were given permission to come up and sit behind him. So he's looking into the mirror, and there is a crowd of 50 or 100 people behind him who have paid money to watch Dickens rehearse. <laughs> he was that good. And it's actually kind of an interesting thing, the idea of, of the mirror. So they're watching the mirror image of him as he is practicing to be the theatrical Dickens, and that mirror is still there, and this, this is the Charles Dickens room at that hotel, and they're, mm -hmm. they're of course, very proud of this. this. If I were teaching a course on Dickens at Bismarck State, this would be the final exam, Larry. This is the 1867 trip, and he's leaving England. And this character here is John Bull. It's not a character out of Dickens. This is the embodiment of Great Britain. Everybody else is a character out of Dickens. Mm. So then the question is the final exam. Identify these characters, <laughs> say when the novel was published, write a little piece about what they represent. So I won't ask us to go through this, but here they are. There's Dickens himself, leaving in 1867. Uh, that's John Bull. There's Peggotty and little Emily from David Copperfield. Here's um, Seth Pecksniff and his daughters from the anti-American novel Martin Chuzzlewit. Pecksmith, as you can see, 
is a contemptible snob and pompous hypocrite. Here's Sam Weller, Mrs. Gamp, and the immortal Pickwick from the Pickwick Papers. This is, Sa this is the famous Samuel Pickwick, and maybe the, the character who made Dickens' careers, his uh, valet, Samuel Weller. There's Betsy Trotwood from David Copperfield. There's uh, the unmistakable Wilkins Mickhopper from David Copperfield. Anyway, you yes. can, if you spend enough time, you can identify all of them. I love this caricature of Dickens. It's just, a, I think, a marvelous piece of art. But one of the things I wanted to talk about, now we'll move out of, unless you have more to say about America. Nope. Let's move just in sh briefly into Dickens' greatness. Um, Harold Bloom has a number of books on world literature, including one called Genius. And in his book, Genius, he, he lists 100 geniuses and tries to explain why Beethoven was Beethoven. And, why Chaucer was Chaucer, and you know, why Virgil was Virgil, what it is about them. And here's what he says. One mark of an originality that can win canonical status as a great work for a literary work is a strangeness that we either never altogether assimilate or that becomes such a given that we are blinded to its idiosyncrasies. What he's saying, Larry, is, is that all, he says in this book, all great art has something of the uncanny about it. Uncanny both in strange, but also slightly destabilizing or mysterious or unsettling, that the greatest art has this uncanny energy about it. And if ever that were true, it's true of Dickens. His, you know, his eccentrics, these characters with tics and with odd habits and mechanical repetitions of gesture or saying, or wearing odd sorts of clothes. But the, un, the eerie, the uncanny, the macabre, the, the eccentric in Dickens is really the genius of Dickens. So here, let me just show you a few. Here's Miss Havisham from Great Expectations. You know, if there were nothing in Dickens except Miss Havisham, he'd be one of the world's great artists. She was jilted on her wedding day, and she has lived in her wedding dress ever since. And the clock on the wall and all the clocks in her house are stopped at the moment when she got the news that her fiancé was jilting her. And the table is still set for guests who never came. The cake is still here with its spider webs and mold. When you first come upon this, two things happen. First of all, you think, that is the craziest, most bizarre thing in the world. But then you think, you immediately think, I'm in the presence of one of the world's supreme literary geniuses. That, I mean, what he's obviously doing is saying that she became psychologically paralyzed by this horrible trauma, but he's visualized it in a way that is unforgettable and magnificent in its own macabre energy. Here's an earlier version of the film with uh, Miss Havisham pointing out her cake to Pip. <laughs> she brings Pip in to court her granddaughter Estella and she asks her granddaughter Estella to break his heart over and over and over again. Her bitterness against men is so great that she wants her beautiful granddaughter to destroy uh, all the men that she ever meets, beginning with this boy. Here's a scene that's unbelievable in its power, also from Great Expectations. This is Jaggers, the famous lawyer. He's a lawyer, Larry, who handles all the worst crimes. You know, he doesn't handle simple real estate transaction. He handles the low, dark underworld of London society. And every time he meets with a client, when they leave, he washes his hands with lavender soap. The minute the clients leave, he perpetually goes to this beautiful lavender soap and washes his hands carefully. That's marvelous. He has this maid named Molly, and Pip comes with a 
friend of his to have dinner with Jaggers. Jaggers is a very scary character. And, and this Molly is a very brooding, dark, kind of meek woman. And Jaggers, in the course of this meal, is saying, I know the dark side of every human being. And he says, Molly, show them your wrists. And she doesn't want to do it. She asks again and again, please, don't make me do it. Don't make me do it. Jagger says, you will show them your wrists. She shows them her wrists, and they're scarred from her attempts to commit suicide. And so he, he found out everybody's secrets, everybody's dark side, everybody's vulnerabilities, and he's able to use them. And he's pretty generous with people, but he knows these capacities. And this is a, an illustration of her being forced to show her self-mutilations. This is, as anyone who knows Dickens knows, is Wilkins Micawber, one of my very favorite of all Dickens characters. Micawber is his father, essentially, perpetually bankrupt. And Micawber is always saying that he hopes that, quote, something will turn up. Nothing ever does. You know, he just lives from um, bankruptcy to bankruptcy through his life. Here's another great picture of him. You, some of you will know the W.C. Fields portrayal of Micawber. But here's a passage from it. This is the most famous of all Micawber's passages. He's smart, even though he can't live smart. He says to um, David Copperfield, annual income, 20 pounds. Annual expenditure, 19 pounds, 19 and six. Result, happiness. <laughs> annual income, 20 pounds. Annual expenditure, 20 pounds, ought and six. Result? Misery. <laughs> and look at this uh, scene from your page, same page, Tale of Two Cities and David Copperfield. Mick Cobber is one of those florid, rhetorical, grandiloquent characters. He's a, he's a lovely, lovely character in Dickens. His only fault is that he can't live within his means. And he's given to writing these marvelous letters to everybody. And here is one of the great scenes. Um, you know, he, he and Mick Cobber knew each other in a blacking factory, or and David Copperfield knew each other in a blacking factory. So they met. And he became a kind of a surrogate father to uh, David Copperfield in that factory. And he says, "This is late in the novel, and Mick Cobber is going to take a job now because he's been bankrupted again as a law clerk for somebody, a low-level law clerk, about ten miles away." He says, "My dear Copperfield." said Mr. Micawber, rising with one of his thumbs in each of his waistcoat pockets. The companion of my youth, if I may be allowed the expression, and my esteemed friend Traddles, if I may be permitted to call him so, will allow me, on the part of Mrs. Micawber, myself and our offspring, to thank them in the warmest and most uncompromising terms for their good wishes. It may be expected that on the eve of a migration which will consign us to a perfectly new existence, Mr. Micawber spoke as if they were going 500,000 miles. I should offer a few valedictory remarks to two such friends as I see before me, but all that I have to say in this way, I have said. Whatever station in society I may attain through the medium of the learned profession of which I am about to become an unworthy member, I shall endeavor not to disgrace, and Mrs. Micawber will be safe to adorn. Under the temporary pressure of pecuniary liabilities, contracted with a view to their immediate liquidation, but remaining unliquidated through a combination of circumstances, I have been under the necessity of assuming a garb from which my natural instincts recoil. I allude, of course, to spectacles and possessing myself of a cognomen to which I can establish no legitimate pretensions. All I have to say on that score is that the cloud has passed from the dreary scene and the god of day is once more high upon the mountaintops on Monday next, on the arrival of the four o'clock afternoon coach at Canterbury, my foot will be on my native heath, my name, Micawber. What he's saying is that he is traveling in disguise because he's going to be arrested for debt, <laughs> and he's changed his cognomen and his last name to something else. And throughout the novel, he's always saying, Copperfield, I find myself under temporary pressure of pecuniary liabilities, <laughs> meaning he's hopelessly in he's debt broke. and about to be arrested. He's just a great character and, and a life-affirming character. And Dickens is full of these wonderful, wonderful creatures. This is uh, Fagin, uh, the Jewish hoodlum from Oliver Twist. This is poor Oliver Twist, and this is the Artful Dodger. This is Fagin when he goes to prison and 
dies horribly at the end of the novel. Here's another picture of Fagin. Dickens was accused of being an anti-Semite for this portrait of a Jewish money lender and pawnbroker, and so he tried to make amends in several later novels. This is Samuel Pickwick, of the, the president of the Pickwick Club. Uh, that's Samuel Weller, his famous uh, mouthy um, cockney valet. This is the odious and reptilian Uriah Heep from David Copperfield. This is um, uh, the, the, the midget in the old curiosity shop. What is his name? Can't help you. Don't remember this? Quilp. Quilp, the horrible, misshapen. Quilp, you were about to say that? Yeah. Yep. Uh, this is uh, Nicholas Nickleby and, and Smike in Nicholas Nickleby. Anyway, so those are a few of the, I keep doing that, those are a few of the great characters. Before we close and maybe take some questions, I want to just do something here, Larry. Yeah, we need to. I want to, in Garrison, North Dakota, every year there's the Dickens Festival, and I've gone this year again, last Saturday. This is the Queen Elizabeth. This is the scene of Garrison, North Dakota, last week, Saturday. Here's a... Dickensian couple serving homemade donuts. There's ye old barber shop and ye old <laughs> dental shop, ye old malt shop and eatery, and ye old copy of Dickens. <laughs> I'm sorry to say that this is the only copy of Charles Dickens that could be had in the city of Garrison. And you see how well it is surrounded by that very pop culture that Dickens, and Dickens so hated on his trip here. That's it. That's what you can buy of the literature of Dickens. <laughs> um, but it is actually great fun to go there, mm -hmm. and they have a wonderful festival, and they do performances of um, A Christmas Carol. Um, it's really worth doing if you've never done it. <coughs> so go ahead. No. I, are we ready to wrap up and go to some questions, maybe? We should go to questions. Yeah. Well, first, before we do, I was going to, the, the one thing I was looking for is uh, uh, de Tocqueville's uh, quotation in Democracy in America that I think is so apropos of Charles Dickens coming to America and criticizing America. And de Tocqueville said, a stranger who injures American vanity, no matter how justly, may make up his mind to be a martyr. That's, that's what happened. That's what happened to Charles Dickens. Before we go to questions, I want to just read this one more. So if you go to Bleak House, it's hard to beat the opening of A Tale of Two Cities. It's on the back of the timeline. But, if, but this passage, I won't read all of it, but this passage from the opening of Bleak House is one of the great, great pieces of English literature. Bleak House is about the law's delay, how the court system in England didn't provide speedy justice and cases would go on for years, sometimes decades, sometimes they would never be settled and they'd be like the Hatfields and the McCoys. By the time that they were settled, no one remembered what they were about. And it's a book about the, the broken bureaucracy of the judicial system of England um, in the mid 19th century. It's about much more than that, but so this first passage is designed to give you a sense of the morass of, of British life in London, in Chancery, Chancery is a court. London, Michaelmas term lately over, and the Lord Chancellor sitting in Lincoln's Inn Hall, implacable November weather, as much mud in the streets as if the waters had but newly retired from the face of the earth, and it would not be wonderful to meet a megalosaurus. 40 feet long or so, waddling like an elephantine lizard up Holborn Hill, smoke lowering down from the chimney pots, making a soft black drizzle with flakes of soot in it as big as full-grown snowflakes, gone into mourning, one might imagine, for the death of the sun. Dogs, undistinguishable in mire, horses, scarcely better, splashed to their very blinkers, foot passengers jostling one another's umbrellas 
and a general infection of ill temper and losing their foothold at street corners where tens of thousands of other foot passengers have been slipping and sliding since the day broke, if day ever broke, adding new deposits to the crust upon crust of mud, sticking at those points tenaciously to the pavement and accumulating at compound interest. Fog everywhere. Fog up the river where it flows among green eights and meadows. Fog down the river where it rolls defiled among the tiers of shipping and the waterside pollutions of a great and dirty city. Fog on the Essex marches. Fog on the Kentish Heights. Fog creeping into the cabooses of collier brigs. Fog lying out on the yards and hovering in the rigging of great ships. Fog drooping on the gunwales of barges and small boats, fog in the eyes and throats of ancient Greenwich pensioners, wheezing by the firesides of their wards, fog in the stem and bowl of the afternoon pipe of the wrathful skipper down in his close cabin, fog cruelly pinching the toes and fingers of his shivering little prentice boy on deck, chance people on the bridges peeping over the parapets into another sky of fog with fog all around them as if they were up in a balloon and hanging in the misting clouds. <laughs> that is so fabulous. I mean, if he, you, now the scene for the novel has been set. You have this picture of pollution and rain and darkness. I remember when I was at Oxford, it would get dark at about 4 p.m., Larry, and it would just be this gray all day and rainy and drizzly, and then at 4 p.m. it would grow dark, and you just think, as the light disappeared Where's from the, the world, yeah. and so he's, he's nailed it. I mean, he's just, he has that capacity. And I know you would say, doesn't waste any time on brevity, <laughs> uh, but he's, he's trying to air it out to give you this full portrait of, of the world of the London law courts. It's aired out. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you would think that. Okay, we've got a microphone here. We've got questions. Please wait for Robin to get the microphone up to you so that the folks... Maybe uh, they just want to go. You know? Maybe they... Well, but we do have something else I want to talk about, too, before we conclude today. But are there any questions? Or thoughts? No questions Oh, here's at all. one down here. Come on down. Uh, oh. It's right here in the fourth row. Not a question, just a comment. Oh, good. Here's wait, for your wait for the microphone. Wait for the microphone. There you go. You'll be on demand. <laughs> I was fascinated by listening, listening to you read it orally, and I think at, at the time Dickens was writing, a lot of his stuff was, written, was read orally, wasn't it? Yes. It, what happened was that these weekly numbers or monthly numbers would come out, and England was very literate at the time. Literacy rates were extremely high, and then someone in the household, they would sit around the coal fire, and someone would read this week's or this month's installment, and of course, it's written in such a way that it just kind of begs to be read in a somewhat theatrical fashion. And so this would, these families would be doing this. Plenty of people were reading it in the traditional way, but, but the oral presentation of Dickens was a big feature of its genius, and he, and he was always on to that as a, so as a system. So is it true to say Dickens is better heard than read? Then? No, no, Larry, it's not true. Okay. Larry. <laughs> we got a question up there. One thing that I think is worth uh, mentioning is the fact that uh, Charles Dickens also was very important as a man who by himself was able to force change. And I think if you look at his first uh, couple books, his first couple novels, he would bring up some social issue like the debtor's prison mm -hmm. or factory life. And within maybe a year or two after the novel was published, there would actually be reform that would take place in the way of laws. Mm -hmm. And I think in that way, as one man, he was able to change a lot of things that, that he found distasteful by writing about them and making them uh, known to the people and forcing change through mm -hmm. legislation. So, some of that Excellent. did occur with Dickens, and in this book, American Notes, towards the end, he has this wrap-up chapter, and he makes a number of points about America, that our media is part of the problem, that it whips up the vulgarity of American civilization, and goes into our hygiene, and he actually 
anticipates where we are and says, these people just eat all the time and then they're sedentary. And he said, they're going to have to reform their digestive <laughs> regimen if they want to survive as a people. Thank goodness he's not here now. Um, but, but he also says about the shipping, you know, that in, in, a, in a ship there would be a few people in first class and then there would be a cabin class of people and then there'd be steerage. And at the time, these um, immigration companies were rounding up people in Liverpool and Portsmouth and Southwark and so on and getting them onto these ships. And he says, this shouldn't be allowed. There should be regulations and international agreements that you can't go on one of these ships if there isn't a medical attendant there. You can't overcrowd the ships, that everyone's um, uh, should be checked to make sure they have enough food to get across the ocean for the journey. He's a classical liberal wanting government to step in to protect the weakest elements of British and international society from their own weaknesses, enforcing child labor laws and workmen's compensation laws and um, humane shipping laws and so on. He wants government, British government, to reform the, the worst abuses of the emerging capitalist system. And I was really surprised at the kind of forward-looking mm -hmm. liberal attitude of, of the book, but that's right, that he, he was a social conscience for Britain of the time and the United States to a certain degree. Here's one. Am I all right? You're doing okay. <laughs> yes. Could you elaborate a little more on what Dickens was against with the Industrial Revolution? Did he feel that they were losing things with that, things that he held dear opposed to what they gained? The question, yeah, the question is about what the Industrial Revolution lost. Well, for one thing, he believed, it was sort of in the same thing that Cervantes believed, that, that journeying should, be, should take time and you should be thrown among strangers and wind up having food with them and having conversations and sharing a coach with them. And when the, ra when the railroads came along, it became much more about getting there than about the journey. And so he loved the old coach culture of England with these wonderful inns. I've been to some of these historic inns and they are wonderful places. And so he thought that some, some form of community was being lost, to some, the, the exchange of personalities and the chance to meet people not necessarily like yourself that came with that kind of travel. Today, I, you know, I'm on airplanes all the time and you could fly across this country and people don't talk to each other who are sitting next to each other. But in that era, there was, you were inevitably going to spend four days getting from London to Edinburgh, and so you were going to get to know each other pretty well on those journeys. So he didn't like the, the violence of the industrial system that was coming, the steamboats and the, and the railroads. He didn't like the, the, the creation of anonymity and the loss of, of community. Uh, but he probably, like all of us, had a nostalgia for the social conditions of his youth. You know, if he had been born 40 years later, he, he probably would have simply embraced the industrial model of the world. But for Dickens, in, at no point does he set his novels in the, the time in which he actually lived. He always set them in the 1820s and 30s at a time when, before the big industrialization occurred. I, I, think, he, I think he was frightened of modernity but, and I think he was comfortable with the conditions of his childhood. And if you were doing a psychological analysis of Dickens, and I'm not a trained psychologist, I think you would say that he got frozen into his childhood by the trauma of his early puberty when the family uh, collapsed. And the rest of his books are about the betrayal of children. Many of the rest of his books are about the betrayal of children by adults who have behaved irresponsibly. And I think that because of that, he was locked into that moment, which would have been 1824 before the great industrial um, transformation of England occurred. So there's probably a positive and a negative reason for it. Any other thoughts? Any other questions? I think we've probably done it. Yeah. How many of you are more likely to read Dickens now or never again? <laughs> More, 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 yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've, I've actually provided a list of the ways that you could do it. You don't, and everyone's list is different. I remember when I was at Oxford, I asked my tutor once, which Dickens novel do you like best? And he was kind of a Pumble Chukian character. And he said, 
I find the one I like best is the one I read most recently. <laughs> but I, so everyone's list is different. I've listed my favorite, and I think if you, if you want to start somewhere, um, start with Great Expectations. It's short, it's only 547 pages. It, it, is, it reads like a novel, it has, it has Aristotelian beginning, middle, and end. It's, it's his, his imaginative maturity is just through the roof. Uh, it has Miss Havisham and Jaggers. It's, I think, the best way to get fascinated by Dickens, and then after that you can go to the Pickwick Papers and, and you're off and running. Go ahead, Larry. Well, if there are no more questions about uh, Dickens or comments at all, then I would like to just, and I've been sort of watching the time because I wanted to make sure that we could hear a little bit of, because I know you got a lot of fans out here that like your reading, and I know many people read your column today, and I know that you've been out on a book tour. Uh -huh. And so I thought we'd just sort of conclude the day with talking about your most recent publication, For the Love of North Dakota, and other essays, Sundays with Clay and the Bismarck Tribune. For those of you that haven't seen that, maybe you have, but why don't you tell us the response you're getting to this. Well, it's a, it's a collection of, of the essays that I write on Sundays for the Bismarck Tribune, plus a photo section of my photographs of North Dakota and so on, and I've been doing this sort of book tour. It's, the book is selling very, very well, surprisingly well. Um, you know, we're really out of time, Larry. No, no, I, I think just, I, no, no. This, I, this is not yeah, Dickens, I, I know. you know, we're talking, well, you were talking about writers in the Pantheon, yeah, yeah, and yeah. I immediately thought of you. <laughs> you know, the, what, a low, what a low way to end the great <laughs> afternoon. Um, the book is selling very well, and people okay. are buying multiple copies and shipping them off to expats who live in California and Arizona and Mexico and so on. Okay. It's, you know, I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled about it. You know, just I'll say three things about it. Number one, when I moved back to North Dakota seven years ago, the narrative was rural decline and out-migration. What's going to happen to North Dakota? Are we just going to continue to slip? Will towns like Mott just disappear from the face of the earth? You know? And now the story is revolutionized. And now the story is of an industrial revolution of such magnitude that it um, challenges a lot of things we thought we knew about North Dakota. And so that, the shift of that narrative has been an astounding shift in North Dakota history. I travel all over and I see there's a North Dakota buzz mm -hmm. and there's a North Dakota pride. I think you mentioned meeting young people who have pride in North Dakota. Yeah. And, you know, there's a, we mean something in the nation's consciousness in a way we didn't 15 years ago. And so there's this transformation and I've been trying to sort of chronicle that in the course of my time here. I didn't expect to and I, didn't, I don't really want to. I'm not, I'm not inherently interested in oil, but you have to be now. You can't. If you love this place, you have to be interested in this thing that's challenging us right down to our core and making us rich and allowing institutions to flourish and reversing the problem of, of migration. So that's one thing. Secondly, the two theses of my work are, about North Dakota are these. A, North Dakota is an acquired taste. You know, it's not for everybody. Couples in New Jersey don't routinely say, hey, let's move to Harvey, North Dakota. <laughs> you know, we're a cold, isolated, no, we're, not, we're not San Diego, we're not Jackson Hole, we're not Tucson, we're North Dakota. And the second thing is, that has informed my work is that if you don't like North Dakota when it's unpleasant, you can't really like North Dakota. Because, I mean, I'm serious, because in any given year, in any given year, you get 30 or 40 absolutely perfect days, and now you do the math. You know? <laughs> but well, I lived in Southern California for four years, and in, 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 in Southern California, you get 322 perfect days, and then you think, oh, the Santa Ana winds, I'll go mad. If you went mad from wind, you'd be mad in North Dakota. I mean, we don't have, so we, North Dakota's an acquired taste, and you, if you, I mean no disrespect, and of course, I'm talking to the converted, because you're not in Phoenix today, but the number of snowbirds 
that's a sign of North Dakota, you know. The fact that almost every person who has money has a place somewhere else between October and April is, I think, a horrible thing. I wouldn't ban it, <laughs> but it kind of upsets me because North Dakota is this. It's this, you walk out in the morning and you think, whoa, it is cold, or <laughs> that's a gale force wind, you know. And so this book is about, I don't, think you can, I don't think you can love North Dakota just from the calendars that the state tourism department puts out, you know, of the, the perfect family picnic at Lake Sakakawea. Have you tried one? You know, <laughs> have you tried a, if, you go, if you try to have a family picnic on Labor Day or Memorial Day, it is being rained out. <laughs> you all know this, that no, you cannot, if there's a June wedding, it's gonna go inside. We are not that garden place. We are this place, and I think it's magnificent, Larry. I know you don't like the cold and the wind and so on, but I love the raw North Dakota, and I think you have to celebrate that if you love this place. So that's, that's what this book is about, and in spite of that, people are buying it. Okay, yeah. good. So, enough. So, just a couple questions, and then we'll, call, we'll wrap it here. But, uh, Let's wrap it. What's the most uh, interesting question you've been asked on this? I know you've had this book. You've been in... Traveling around. Oregon and Washington, I think, and you've been all over the state here and probably doing it in Virginia. What's the most interesting comment that... Uh, you mean from outsiders? Yeah, from outsiders coming to you to buy the book and to chat with you. Well, there are a couple of comments. Um, one is, really, a book about North Dakota? You know, huh? You know, who do you expect to sell that to? Uh, you know, it's kind of an odd thing. It's we're the least visited state. We don't have a literature like Montana's or Minnesota's or Saskatchewan's. There's a, uh, there's a reason for that, I think, but people are surprised that anyone would actually give human effort to writing a book about North Dakota. Um, and the second thing is, of course, they want to know about the Bakken. And, and everyone's heard of the Bakken now. There isn't, there, all of America knows about the Bakken and they can locate it in western North Dakota. Most people say, man, are you the most fortunate people on earth? You're at full employment, you have budget surpluses, uh, you've gotta be really happy. And then there is a, there's a smaller group of people who say, that fracking is gonna destroy the planet. Uh, and now there's this fracking movie coming out in a couple of weeks, it'll be interesting. I'm, be interesting to see how that the reaction to, is in North Dakota, but the the buzz about North Dakota, it's hard to know what to make of it. You know, if, if you said to me, what are the things about North Dakota you would want people in Seattle or Norfolk to ask about? I wouldn't say mineral development. I would want them to ask about Ukrainian culture or the legacy of the Jeffersonian agrarian dream in North Dakota, or the nonpartisan league, or um, the fact that we have um, five Indian groups in North Dakota, all of which with distinct cultures, and, or the buttes or the prairies or the Little Missouri River Valley or the Elkhorn Ranch. They don't ask about that and they frankly don't know enough to care about that. They might if they did. What they're interested in now is the fact that we're this energy miracle. And so I hope we can use this interest that the world is showing in us to say something about us, about what kind of a people we have been, our heritage, our ethnic culture, our natural resources, our hunting, our recreation. I mean, it's not, a, for me, it's kind of a bittersweet thing to think that we finally became interesting nationally for something that is going to challenge every one of the things that are most characteristic about North Dakota's history and North Dakota's life. And so I'm hoping that this turns into something really remarkable mm -hmm. for North Dakota. I don't know that it will, but those are, the, those are the kinds of questions that are getting asked. I know in your column, not this one, the week before, you and I were uh, having a conversation about it, and maybe most people here can relate to this, that we're finding out and Clay does far more traveling than I do, but I do my fair share of traveling, and I find out that most people now in the country, doesn't matter where you go, they know about North Dakota like they've never known before. They know about North Dakota. They know nothing about North Dakota. It's really interesting. They've heard of North Dakota now. Now they've heard of North Dakota. And of course, every politician who is pro-energy, which is of course most politicians, 
is saying, look at what they do in North Dakota. Yeah. And of course we do, we, thanks to Governor Schaefer and Governor Hoven and the legislature, we've positioned North Dakota to, to be a, a, a good climate for economic activity. And that's really important because some places don't. But it helps that there is, there are 25 billion barrels of oil under our soil, and as far as I know, no North Dakotan had anything to do with that. And so, you know, if we didn't have this oil, they wouldn't be talking about us. It's an accidental fact that we're sitting on top of one of the world's most significant shale oil deposits. And we have, I think I give credit particularly um, to Governor Schaefer because he said, we're open for business, we're gonna create a climate in which different types of enterprises can come and flourish here. And I think that was followed on by Governor Hoban and now followed on by Governor Dalrymple. And I think on the whole, that's very good. I think maybe it's now time to say, okay, we got what we wanted. Now let's back it down a little. But I don't know that that's going to happen. But I think that the, 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 when I see very conservative national politicians saying, why can't Minnesota be more like North Dakota? I want to say, well, how much shale oil is there under Fergus Falls? You know, I mean, we can't get full credit for this economic dream that's going on in North Dakota. So I think there's something a little, it's used as a talking point more than as an actual argument. Yeah. But agriculture is still our number one industry. So far. So far. Still our number one industry. Absolutely. This is a time of extraordinary prosperity in agriculture. People that I know who know about the world of agriculture much more than I do say, in, in North Dakota history, there has never been as much widespread prosperity in agriculture as there is now. Yeah. And so as long yeah. as that continues, we have two fronts. Yeah. I don't think tourism is likely to maintain its market share in the face of that, but we'll see. Okay. So to conclude on one last question, back to Charles Dickens, did he ever visit North Dakota? <laughs> I'm glad you were listening, Larry. <laughs> Let me show you the map. Thank you, everybody, very much. This has been fun. Thank <laughs> you.